samples come, we take them straight to the laboratory, which is uh, infectious handling uh, uh, department. Bacteriology, who handle bacteria, and then virology, who work with vi viruses, and then immunology, who are responsible for investigating immune function. So the three departments are in this building, and they occupy the facilities that you see. So when the samples arrive, we take them straight to the lab that we designated for receiving these respiratory samples. In the field, three types of samples are collected. Throat swabs, nasal swabs, and sputum. Uh, sputum is the most difficult one to work with because it's rather thick. Uh, but we, we managed to work with all those samples. So we go straight to the room where we receive the samples and the team are ready to explain to you what it is. So we usually receive the samples here and here we are able to sort them with the forms that come with them or if they are barcoded samples, we check the system there, scan it to see which site it is coming from. All the information concerning the sample pops up if it's a barcoded sample. Otherwise, we have a form. Can I have one of the forms, please? Yes, so we look at the name and the information here, and we match it with the sample. And then at that point, we give the sample an ID and put the same ID on the form, so that beyond this point, we use only the ID to identify the sample. But we enter the information on the form also into the system, so that at the end of processing, when the results are ready, we are able to assign the results to the sample that came in. So this is where the first point is. At this point, the samples are not opened. And because they are viruses and we want to be very careful, we handle them in a biosafety cabinet. So it's only at this point that we get the samples opened within this cabinet, which is a facility meant for such work. This is a biosafety level two. What we do here is break up the virus so we can get the nucleic acid, the RNA of the virus. So what they are doing, we call it RNA extraction because it is this RNA that we further test in the polymerase chain reaction to be able to detect if the RNA that came in that sample is a coronavirus, the novel coronavirus, or it's not. So what they are doing now is RNA extraction. Welcome. Thank you for coming to see us. <laughs> so we'll go to the uh, PCR room now and show you how we actually do the PCR to directly detect the virus. This is our, our clean and PCR room. So when we start the PCR process, we start from the clean area and we move it slowly to where there is the samples. So this is where we prepare all the master mix. We put the chemicals together so that we are able to amplify, multiply a lot of the genetic material which we isolated from the other room, and then we are able to see. So here has a different set of lab, lab coats, a different set of pipettes. Everything here is separate from all the other things so that we don't have any cross-contamination with anything. So um, fridges and freezers are provided to store, to keep the reagents at the optimum temperatures. For as quality control checks for the um, PCR, for the, uh, for the PCR that we do, we include um, negative controls, positive controls, so that the ne negative controls should be all negative and then the positive controls should show. That means that everything is working well with the PCR that we are doing. And then we add the positive controls here in a completely separate hood so that there's no mixture with a sample, so that if a sample is positive, it's truly positive and it's not something that has been contaminated with a positive control. So Darius, can you show us how a positive sample looks like? Okay, so oh, we, sh use. we have some, some nice curves here. <laughs> so this is a plate that has just been run. This is a really full plate. Yes, so you show us the positive controls. A positive control looks like this. a zygmoidal curve. Yeah. Where you see the curve twisting itself. Whereas a negative control would be a flat curve, no rings. So something like so this. So something flat. like this is negative. So all of these samples... So this particular sample, for example, is negative. And then we can scan through and we'll be able to ascertain whether the samples are actually negative or positive. So one of these, you can it's see is a positive sample. So we can then go through and find out which sample is positive. And then we'll make the readings and reports to 
our data team? Very special. We call them next generation sequencing uh, equipment, next equipment. And there are only two in Ghana so far, these two here. And they are so specialized that when you are able to obtain a sample, let's say from an infected, a suspected person, or even from a vector, like a mosquito, let's say yellow fever, or any pathogen you suspect, no matter what the source, when you process it according to the sequencing you know, procedures, and you put it in here, you can use, we have short, short amplicons, we have um, probes that we use to amplify certain regions of the genome of potential parasites. And those universal primates, when we use them, we are able to magnify any pathogen that is in the sample. And so it doesn't matter whether you are looking for COVID or for yellow fever or for dengue or anything. We are able to get everything that is in that sample. And we are able to analyze it to very high levels in the sense that the sequences that we get, the information we are able to tell even if there is, let's say, mutations that are related to drug resistance or whether the genome, the way it is, whether we can use it, information from there to even look at future development of vaccines or even for drug you know, development. So the equipment are so specialized that one thing that we are looking for is in the future using these as some of the basis for surveillance in the country. So working with the Ghana Health Service, the surveillance directorate, to be able to look at what really is happening as far as emerging and re-emerging disease pathogens are concerned in the country. So these are the value of these equipments. So they're actually like this. This is for HIV. You add the blood sample, you get a result within 10 minutes. And um, we're hoping to determine if some of the commercial kits that have come for COVID could also do, perform the same way. So this is antibody uh, detection. And um, you can see that they're working in a row because specific the tests are. So this has been done for HIV. This is a different team at, at work right now. But we intend to do the same thing for, for COVID-related antibody tests. We actually, we actually grow cells. We grow cells and then we try and isolate the virus. So these two rooms are very special. We use them for just culturing cells. And when we want to isolate the virus, we then move the cells into the next room. So we've actually started culturing the coronavirus. We're hoping to be able to have isolates that we can use to characterize very soon. So Mr. Kansi is from our maintenance department, and this CCTV camera shows you what is inside here. This is a suite of biosafety level three for, uh, labs. If we were at biosafety level four, we'd be dressing up like astronauts with you know, dedicated oxygen supply. This is why this building is so expensive. These labs are under negative pressure, specific uh, temperature, specific humidity. So when we're working with dangerous pathogens like Ebola, Lassa, you know, the viral hemorrhagic fever things, we don't culture them. We just take them straight in there, dress up properly, full suit, full overalls, gowns, uh, uh, boots, everything, the double gloves. And then with there, what you saw, the RNA manipulation, whatever, apart from virus culture, we do all that in there. And his job is to ensure that whilst we are working in there, nothing goes wrong. So we have one for viruses and the one for bacteria. And we are using all of them now for COVID work. So you can see that two of our colleagues are in there doing exactly the same thing that we do out there. So we have eight people working at a time. That's another reason why we've been able to process so many samples. So we are not going in by just seeing that these are the two suites independently. You can see the mechanism because it has to be negative pressure, specific humidity, and anything that we work in there has those giant autoclaves. They are all <laughs> disinfected, decontaminated before they come out. Is the fact that we have to maintain uh, uh, and keep the samples. So as, as we uh, explained, right now we have no backlog. So these are samples that we just received today, and this will be processed tonight. At the height of the thing, this whole place was full with all these packages. So this is the sample software that is being used right now, the barcode thing. You can see the map. And then this is the kind of, of, of summary that we generate. And you increase the, increase the size. Okay, so the number of samples we processed, the number that are positive, the contact tracing. So this is one of the latest summaries that we just produced. And they go to the other the, the half. So this is the entire list of all the positives from all the hospitals, entire, an entire database, okay? So we have them all from the beginning to the end. And then go to the contact tracing. 
same thing. So we are 2,919. These are all the proceeds from the contact trace. Yeah. Okay. Do the dates to recovery. Is that you have that fund too? That's not yet. So another thing we've done is we have a separate database for all those who are positive, their first test, their second test, and their fourth test because two consecutive tests means you are negative and then you play the virus. But we have them here as uh, the list test data. Okay. Then we have for each person, we monitor the virus sample that are brought in and to determine whether the first sample is still positive, second positive, and up to when they are negative for the doctors to make clinical decisions based on that. And that is separate from the other data, so we don't have any double counting. Say a very big thank you to you. Because since we started this journey of COVID-19 emergency response, we have experienced very, very, you know, matured, competent leadership from you. And everything has gone smoothly so far. And we believe that as we continue to put in the hard work, the way you are driving the ship, we'll very soon be able to contain COVID-19. I would like to also say, on behalf of the Institute and the University, a very big thank you to you for that foresight to, do, to, to, to do, dedicate some funding for the exercise. It has come in handy, and we are very grateful for it. And we look forward to the future. We believe that the signals that we have seen from your end, that in the future this institute will benefit from some regular annual budget country, I mean, uh, uh, to, the, to, to run the institute to maintain the facility. And that will be the, the, the end of the line, the flagship. Thank you very much, Mr. President. Thank you. Very grateful indeed for the work that you're doing here. It's uh, been breathtaking. I want to thank you very much.